Welcome to video four for week four. In this video, I want to do some examples of the things I defined in the previous video. So calculating mass and first moments and second moments, centers of mass and radii of gyration. So let me start with a lamina example first. So this is a quarter circle of radius A in the first quadrant, and it has this density. Since it's a quarter circle and the density looks like it has circular symmetry, polar coordinates seem appropriate, so I'm going to use polar coordinates. Square root of x squared plus y squared and polar coordinates, that's just the radius term. And then this quarter circle can be described very, very nicely in polar coordinates of the bounds of 0 to a in the radius. And to get the first quadrant, I have 0 to 2 pi in the angle. So with that set up, I can calculate the mass. There are the bounds. Kr was the density. And then I also have an additional r for the Jacobian, making sure to never forget my Jacobian terms. Do those two integrals. It's separable. I can do them separately. I get that the mass is pi k a cubed over 6. Now I want to calculate my coordinates of the center of mass. So x bar is 1 divided by m times the first moment in x, and likewise for y bar. So the first moment in x is calculated as the integral of y rho dA. Remember the moment in x is the, dist is the distance out from the x-axis, which is the y-coordinate. So the same bounds here. Um, the y-coordinate is r sine theta, so that's where the sine theta comes from. Kr was the density, so that needs to be part of this as well. The density is there, and I also have an additional r from the Jacobian, so that explains how I get r cubed. One from the y-coordinate, one from the density, and one from the Jacobian. So I integrate that to dr d theta over these bounds, do the details of those integrals, dividing by the mass at the end to give me the coordinate of the center of mass here, which is 3 over 2 pi a. This is a nice place to always check that this is reasonable. So I have this thing which has radius a here. Then the x-coordinate of the center of mass is less than a, so it's going to be some number in here, 3 over 2 pi times a. And that's good, because if the center of mass was somewhere out here, I would know I'd done something strange. But this is a believable center of mass. It makes sense that the x-coordinate of the center of mass is a little bit less than half of a. And this object is symmetric in x and y, this quarter circle, and the density only depends on the radius, so that's also symmetric in x and y. So I expect the y-coordinate of the center of mass to be exactly the same as the x-coordinate. Whenever I can make a symmetry argument, it's really, really valuable to do so because it tends to save me a lot of calculation. So I expect the center of mass of this to be at this y-coordinate and this x-coordinate. All right, now I want to consider another lamina, which is a shape bounded between negative 1 and 1 that looks roughly like plus or minus y to the 4. So it's going to look sort of like this. This, these, these are these quartic shapes, so it's going to be a lamina that has this kind of shape. I have constant density. I want to calculate the area and the moment of inertia around the x-axis. So this thing spinning around the x-axis. How difficult is it to spin this thing around the x-axis? Uh, there's your area calculation. I'm going to do this just in Cartesian coordinates. There's not really any circular symmetry here, so Cartesian coordinates is reasonable. So the bounds in y are negative 1 to 1. The bounds in x were given by negative y to the 4 plus y to the 4, so that was just all given to us. I do that integral and I get that the area of this shape is 4 fifths between y equals negative 1 and y equals 1. Then I calculate the x moment of inertia. This is the one I care about because I'm interested in the moment of inertia around the axis. I want to know how difficult it is to spin this thing around the x-axis. So the moment of inertia, inertia is the same bounds, and since it's around the x-axis, I calculate y squared. Uh, I have no Jacobian here because I'm working in Cartesian coordinates. The density is 1. So that's just the integral I need to do. Do that calculation, I get 4 sevenths. And I want to do a little bit of interpretation with what that means here, this moment of inertia, 4 sevenths. So I want to compare this lamina that I have to a rectangle of the same area. So I'm going to take a rectangle of height 2 and width 2 fifths, because the area of this thing was 4 fifths. So if I take a rectangle that has height 2 and width, width 2 fifths, it's a similar kind of shape. And if I did the moment of inertia calculation, I'm going to skip some of the setup here, but if I did the moment of inertia calculation, 
around the x-axis of that, I would get 4 fifteenths. So what I notice is that even though they have the same cross-sectional area, this lamina that I've defined has a larger moment of inertia around the x-axis. And that's because there's more of it further away and closer to the x-axis, there's less of it. And this is one of the reasons why in static engineering and construction, you see things like I-beams used instead of just sort of straight cross-sectional pieces of wood or metal. The reason is that to rotate these around the x-axis, it's sort of like the shearing them to try and press them down, to try and get them to go out of shape. It's actually much, much harder to do that to an I-beam than it is to do that to this thing with a rectangular cross section, even if they have exactly the same area, which means they have exactly the same amount of metal used to construct them. So these are the kind of calculations that people do in statics, in, in construction and in engineering design. Lots of use of moments of inertia to try and figure out what the stability of certain objects are, what kind of designs you want such that there's the greatest resistance possibly to movement when you're building something you don't want to move. Or let me do some examples in R3 now. Now I want to consider a hemisphere that has radius A that sits above the xy plane. So this is half a sphere of radius A. It has the density function rho equals kz. And I want to calculate all of its properties. Its mass, its first moments, its second moments, its center of mass, its radius of duration, all of these things. Since it's a half sphere, I want to use spherical coordinates, which means I need to change the z into r cos phi. And that's what z is in spherical coordinates. So I'm going to use spherical coordinates, and I'm going to use symmetry arguments whenever they're available to me to try and make sense of what's going on here. So there's going to be a lot of integrals in this example. I'm not going to do all the integrals in detail. Um, I'll have those details in the notes for you if you want. I'm mostly concerned about the setup. So start with a mass integral. To describe this half sphere, longitude goes all the way around. Co-latitude only goes down to pi over 2. This is the half sphere above the xy plane, so the top half of the sphere. So instead of co-latitude going all the way to pi to go from the north pole to the south pole, I only go to what would be the equator, which is at pi over 2, and then uh, the radius goes from 0 to a. So these are the reasonable bounds for the top half of the sphere. All right. So I have the Jacobian r squared sine phi, I have the dr d phi d theta, I have the density, which is kz, which is kr cos phi. Put all of these things together, this is a nice separable iterated integral, so I can separate the theta integral out and do it, I just get 2 pi. I can do the radius integral, and then after that I can do the phi integral. The steps of integration are all here. I get that the mass of this thing is going to be pi k a to the 4 over 4. Now I'm going to calculate the first moments. The first thing I'm going to argue is that these two moments have to be zero. So let me think for a moment about what this shape is. So this is a hemisphere. And its density only depends on the height. The density was kz. So its density increases as they go up the height. But if I look at the distance from the yz or the xz plane, the distance from these vertical planes, these vertical planes are going to slice the thing directly in half, and the density is going to be equal in either half of the plane, since the density only depends on the height. I'm going to get a quarter sphere in either half of the plane with the same density of each side of the quarter sphere. So I can actually argue that these two moments, which measure the distribution of mass on either side of these vertical planes, have to be zero. They're the same thing. The only one I'm interested in is the existence above the xy plane, and that one's not going to be zero because all of the mass is above the xy plane. So I'm going to be looking at what that moment should be. So I calculate the moment, uh, so the first moment above the xy plane, so that's the integral of the shape of z. So here are the same bounds. Here I have my Jacobian. I have kz times z, so I have kz squared, which turns into kr squared cos squared phi. So I have an r cos phi from the density, which is had a z in it. I have another r cos phi from the z in the setup of this integral. So that explains the integrand. And then I do all these pieces. This is a nice separable integral again. The theta integral is just 2 pi. There's the radius integral. There's the uh, co-latitude integral. Two of the integrals get this. The centers of mass in the x and y directions have to be zero because those moments were zero. 
the center of mass in the z direction is this divided by the mass that gives me 8a over 15 and again I want to interpret this so here's my hemisphere drawn one more time so its center of mass is 0 in x and y that makes sense it's symmetric over those and it has a height which is less than a so a is the total height here that also makes sense this is a convex object the center of mass should be inside it if I got a number here that is larger than a then the center of mass would sit above this thing which wouldn't make any sense whatsoever so always think about the values in these practical applications to say does this actually make sense I'm going to briefly set up the rest of the calculations there's a lot of integrals here but I want to calculate the moments use the formulas for the moments and make sure you include the density the density is kz and then change all of these things into polar coordinates into spherical coordinates so y squared turns an r squared sine squared phi sine squared theta z squared turns an r squared cos squared phi this z turns into r cos phi there's my jacobian there are my infinitesimal terms there are my bounds i put this guy up front so i get some pretty complicated integrals but it's all just translating everything over from the Cartesian expressions, the things that are finding, into the spherical expressions here. Then I get about a bunch of steps of integration. I'll not go over all of those steps. I'm going to argue that this thing should have the same moment of inertia around the x-axis and the y-axis. Again, that's by symmetry. I think about this hemisphere. The difficulty of spinning around the x-axis or spinning on the y-axis should be the same it has the same distribution of mass over those two axes the difficulty of spinning around the z-axis is something entirely different so again i calculate that moment of inertia using the form that i defined in the previous video um, rho turns into r cos phi x squared plus y squared gives me r squared sine squared phi if you sort of calculate those and use the sine squared plus cos squared theta it'll cancel off some simplification I get the Jacobian term again, never forget your Jacobian term. Do the calculation, get a moment of inertia around the z-axis as well. And then I can calculate the value of gyration by taking the moment of inertia and dividing by the mass and taking the square root. And again, these are reasonable numbers. These are numbers that are less than the radius of this hemisphere. So to spin it around, it acts like a point mass a certain distance away. If that distance was larger than the distance the radius of the hemisphere that would seem a little weird that would not fit the distribution of mass so these are reasonable numbers for the radii of gyration one last example this is another paraboloid i'm interested in the moment of inertia of this paraboloid so this paraboloid again is set up above the xy plane um, with this equation i want to use cylindrical coordinates those are good for a paraboloid so this can turn into d r squared in cylindrical coordinates um, I want the solid paraboloid up to a certain height h. I need to do some setup here. If z is equal to dr squared, then what is the radius at the top here? Well, this is height h, and this is this number b is going to be the radius. Or this is going to be, be the square. My apologies. But if I solve for so at height h, if I replace z with h and solve for r, I get that the radius at height is the square root of h over b. So this goes to indicate you're not always sort of given all the pieces you want. Sometimes you have to solve them by the setup. You've got some parameter b in the in the system. You're told you want to reach a certain height h. I would like to know what the radius is that's that height h of this paraboloid. I need to do some algebra to do that. This lets me set up the bounds sort of like I did in the cylindrical coordinates video, video one for this week. Circular uh, bound, this goes all the way around. The paraboloid goes all the way around. There's no restriction on the angle. If I take the radius going from this out to this maximum radius, then the height can be taken as going from the line here all the way up to the constant h. And that line there is just z equals dr squared. That's the description of the paraboloid that we started with. So I can take the bounds of the height to be this going up to the constant h. So that gives me nice bounds and cylindrical coordinates. I need to calculate the mass. So there are my 0 to 2 pi, 0 to the maximum radius, and then those non-constant bounds are calculated in z. r is the Jacobian, uh, the density goes as 1, so I don't have to add any density terms. z happens inside r because z depends on r. And then I go through and do this calculation, get my mass. 
and then I wanted to calculate the moments of inertia. So exactly the same setup in the bounds. Here's the moments of inertia. There's my Jacobian. Uh, I change x squared plus y squared into r squared, multiply by the Jacobian to get up a cube, do the integral, get the moment of inertia, divide by the mass to get the square of the radius of generation. I can do the same thing in x. These integrals get a little bit intense, but again, I'm mostly worried about the setup. The same bounds, the definition of the Cartesian coordinates, the Jacobian, change this into polar coordinates, uh, y turns into r squared sine, y squared turns into r squared sine squared theta, z equals z, and then I get a complicated series of integrals based on this, which I'm going to skip over the details of, and I get a moment of inertia. If I divide by the mass, I get the square of the radius of generation. The radius of generation is going to be this. You could analyze this. It turns out to be a pretty reasonable number, and you could also argue that this paraboloid should have the same resistance to rotation around x as it is to rotation around y by symmetry. And that finishes up the examples that I wanted to do. Lots of intense integration here. Please focus more sort of on the setup. I mean, do check the integrals if that's interesting and valuable to you. But I'm really concerned about understanding what a first moment and a second moment are, what a center of mass is, what a radius of generation is, and how to use dense and how to actually set all these things up to do something reasonable and practical with these practical problems.